And then I'm going to share my screen with everybody and go through a few things so we can start today. Um, share screen. Let me go here. Wait, oh, I need to pull this up first. Um, All right, <clears throat> so um, let's go through some business first before we get into uh, our first chapter today. So we're going to meet every Tuesday and Thursday from 9.30 to 10.45. Um, if, and and I, I possibly can go a little longer than that, but some people may have another Zoom class. You have to leave the meeting um, because I'm going to be hard pressed to go to say everything uh, in a hybrid course uh, that we have to cover. So ultimately, there are some things in the PowerPoints that you're going to have to be reading on your own, but I'm going to try and hit uh, the majority of the physiology stuff that I think is harder for students to read on their own. So <clears throat> some days I might continue to go through past our time, but if you have to ever leave, you can if you have to go to another class. All right, because I have a few minutes after this class uh, to continue. And so I'll be recording all of these. And if you have to leave for any reason, I'm going to be posting the video recordings, the Zoom recordings, so you can view them at a later time. All right. So first of all, <clears throat> when you log into the site, you can see all of these fancy little buttons and everything over here. Uh, but everything really is in this module section. So there's two areas that you really need to concentrate on. Well, besides going to grades, you can check your grades. And then obviously the Zoom link over here to always meet. And we're gonna try and meet around 9.25. I was just a little bit late this morning uh, because of my dog, but hopefully that won't happen every time. I'd like to try and get our attendance done by 9.30. So if you can make it by 9.25, that would be great. Um, so you always have to check announcements. Some people don't have uh, Canvas notifications turned on. So they're not getting the announcements and I get emails that have questions concerning what I already posted, which I don't mind answering, but in, in order for you to stay up to date every single time I post an announcement, instead of you having to log in and click on this, you should hit this account button and then turn on notifications. So you hit notifications and there's a whole bunch of different parameters over here that you can set in order to turn them on. And that way, every time I post an announcement, it'll go straight to your email. The next uh, area that's vitally important is the module section. So you click on the module section <clears throat> and um, I have this little thing in the way right here. And as you can see, I have our unit test folder up. Now the unit test are the major exams that we have to cover. Our first unit test is gonna be due by June 15th, which means we have to be finished with the first two chapters in the next week and a half. Um, and the first unit test covers chapters 18 and 20. Then you can see from there what unit two has on it. I changed up the order of the chapters last semester to coincide with the order of the, of the chapters that we cover in lab. Uh, because about a year ago, I kept getting complaints that the lecture was veering off from the lab too much. So I reorganized out the order in which we cover everything. So these four unit tests count as 55% of your grade. So this is where the majority of your points come from. All right. These exams are going to be given via Respondus. So you're going to have to have Respondus, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then our very last unit test, not this one, we're not posting that one, but this last unit test is uh, I always make an open book test. So you're going to have one open book test and the other, the first three are going to be closed book examinations. All right. So this is what we're preparing for to take these exams. Now in the start here module, you need to, if you haven't already done so, review all of these documents. The thing that's the most important within this module 
is reviewing the addendum, which has our course outline on it and our grading rubric, which are really the most important aspects of, of the course. You want to know where your grades coming from um, and what's expected of us this semester. Um, they changed how we purchase Wiley Plus. I only put this in the AMP2 course just in case we have some AMP2 students that did not take AMP1 with Delgado and have used Wiley Plus previously. If you already had Wiley Plus and AMP1, you don't have to go purchase another code. But if you run into a problem with your Wiley Plus account, you need to email me so we can get it corrected if you know you already purchased a code. Because the code is still good for from AMP1 to AMP2. So review that if you need to. If you don't need to, don't waste your time opening it. Um, I need everybody to do these two assignments today. These are our census assignments. I know I put the due date for the 11th, but I really want them done now. Um, the census day, I think, is, is the 14th or the 15th, which means if students don't participate in the class, I have to drop them for non-attendance. So go ahead and just get these done today. This is just a few questions, whatever they are. I'm in this class. I have to do this to be successful, whatever. So just fill that out. This is, introduction is, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm, you know, a nursing major, whatever. You don't have to write a, a book. Just post something so I know you did it. You then, if you don't have Respondus, you have to click this Respondus download link and then install Respondus on your computer. Respondus is the proctoring software that we're gonna to use to take our unit exams. Um, in order to see if your Respondus is working on your computer, you then open Respondus once you down installed it, uh, which is just a browser window, then log back into Canvas and come to here, navigate to here and click on this, Respondus check test. Um, this does not count for points. I know you see three points, but it doesn't count for anything. It's in a section of the grade book that does not count for anything, but I need to see if you can open it and then complete it. If you can open this little quiz and, and do the, the couple little questions that are in there, then your Respondus is working. If you try to click on it and, from Respondus and it asks you for a password, then your Respondus is not working, all right? Um, also in the addendum, I think I put the computer requirements in order for Respondus to work. So you can review that at the end of that addendum. But I can tell you now, if you have a Chromebook or a Mac Air book or any computer laptop that has a, the name book in it, it's not going to work. If you use an Android tablet, it's not going to work. So I do have Respondus set up to allow people to use iPads. I think you have to download from, uh, for iPad or Mac users have to download a, a, a separate app. You might have to go to whatever your app store is and do a search for that. I'm not sure how to do um, that. Go ahead. I have, I have a MacBook Air and it let me do it just fine. Oh, good. I just downloaded it. They have a link on it. It says like download for Mac. Oh, good. And so where, it works. Leslie, where did you find, where did you find the link at? I just clicked oh, uh, download, like respondents download link that you have on there. Oh, and it worked? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Well, thank you for telling me that because I don't see what y'all see. Very good, Leslie. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So Leslie's uh, saying that it works uh, with the Mac Air book. So you're good to go with that. All right. Now, uh, some of this stuff you won't see. I don't have, I don't have published, so you don't have to worry about that some old links down here. Uh, this is not good anymore anyway. I just need to delete it. Um, you don't really have to click on this unless you want to um, because you have Wiley Plus. If you don't have Wiley Plus, then you can click on them if you have time to do that. It's not all that necessary, um, but you are gonna have to have Wiley Plus in order to do these assignments. And each one of our chapter modules, you're gonna have homework assignments at the top, and then you're going to have all of your learning resources at the bottom. So in order to see if your, if your Wiley Plus is working or if you need to purchase a code, you can click on this adaptive practice link, chapter 18 adaptive practice. 
if your Wiley Plus is still working, it's gonna bring you straight to that assignment. If your Wiley Plus is not working, it's gonna try and bring you to a registration page or to set up a Wiley Plus account. That's when you, you have to either email me because you know you paid for it before, or you have to review this document, how to purchase Wiley Plus code, all right? And that's gonna be for very few people. Now, I will say this, these adaptive practice assignments are not worth any points in our class. We just don't have enough time, but I, I, put, I still leave them in there for practice work. I'm not even sure if you're gonna have enough time to do the practice work, but you can if you, if you want. The assignments that count for points are where we have a discussion, some chapters have it and some don't, a little discussion question, uh, just fill that in. You don't have to write a book. I just wanna make sure you're doing the reading. And then we have a chapter quiz and a chapter test for each chapter we cover. These two assignments require Wiley Plus. So without Wiley Plus access, you won't be able to do these assignments, all right? So all of our modules are set up this way, homework at the top. You can or may not have to do adaptive practice. You know, some people are gonna do it, some don't. Uh, it does not count for points on our grade. You then will have a PowerPoint that you're gonna be studying from. And this is what I'm gonna start on today. I updated all of my PowerPoints uh, last semester and all of them should have a chapter whatever lecture PowerPoint. I named them all the same, lecture PowerPoint. These were my older PowerPoints up here, which you won't see anyway. Um, I put either what I call an outline or a note packet in each chapter. And so the two documents that are the most important for you to learn from are gonna be the PowerPoints and whatever note packet or outline that I post in, in that particular chapter. Um, a long time ago, I started, learn, I started to make these learning matrix, matrices, but I, I didn't have enough time to, to finish doing it. So I think I only did it for chapter 18. You can look at that if you want, or you know, just follow the PowerPoint in my note packet will be fine. Each chapter also has a link that will say whatever the chapter name is with ebook chapter. This is the ebook. So when you click on that, you then have to go, it'll bring you to a, a page that has a picture of the book on it over here. And you click on that picture and it'll bring you to another website that says like bookshelf or something. You can set up an account if you want, or if you already have an account and you're used to it, that's fine. I always just say skip this step because I don't have an account and it just brings me straight to the ebook anyway. So if, if you don't have a hard copy of the book and you're just buy and you just bought the uh, Wiley plus code, you should have access to all of the ebook chapters. You should be able to print them out some kind of way. You might be able to right click, but I don't think Mac has right clicks, but you can say print whatever. So that's the ebook. So each chapter is going to have an, a module is going to have an ebook chapter link in it that you can access from anywhere. All right. All right. So let me show you where your grades coming from. So I'm going to go to this assignment section over here. You will never see this. This is just where I put all of our assignments and how I have canvas calculating your grade. So I have a section that I call the quizzes. Um, all of our chapter quizzes and our discussion questions go into this group. This group counts as 10% of your grade, right? So that's all the Wiley quizzes and all the discussions. All of the chapter tests, which are our homework chapter tests, are also worth 10% of your grade. So 20% of your grade comes from all the quizzes, homework quizzes, and all of the homework chapter tests and all of these assignments are open book, all of them. So everybody should spend enough time on them. Um, there's no time limit on them in order to get the best grade that you can because it's, let's face it, it's 20% of your grade, which is, should help you out, all right? 55% of your grade comes from our four unit test. All the first three are closed book examinations and the last one will be an open book test. Um, and for us, that's going to be good because the way I mapped out our unit test due dates at the very end of the semester, which comes very quickly, 
the very last day of school for the summer is July 21st. On the 22nd starts our finals. So we have to have everything done by the 21st, all right? Um, I made the due dates for all of our homework assignments for each chapter due the day before, or the day of it looks like. No, the day before we take a unit test on those chapters. So for instance, all of the homework assignments for chapter 18 and 20 are due on June 14th because the following day we're going to take a test on those two chapters. I hope that makes sense. Now, it does not mean to wait until June 14th to get all of your homework assignments done. You really need to get them done on a daily basis so that you have time to go back and review all of them. So I keep getting questions about when is the due date? When is the due date? You should, when you're in classes, you should not think when is the due date. Uh, you should just do them on, the, on that day when you're covering that material. So I know some teachers have a hard deadline, like if they do something in class this day, you have to have it done by 5 p.m. That's different. The way that I set up all the assignments is I leave them open until we have a major test on them. But just don't wait until then to do it because you're gonna have to be using those homework assignments to study along with your PowerPoints and your note packets. All right, so that's 55% of your grade. And then the other 25% comes from our final examination at the very end of the semester, right? Which makes up 100% of your grade. All right, so does anybody have any questions concerning that? I do. Um, for, the, uh, for the unit test, do we get that amount of time to take it or do you have to take it in that one day? Okay, so I usually give a couple of days. In a regular semester, I usually give five days a week, but I don't think we have enough time um, in the summer session. So I'm actually, where I put the due date for them, I'm gonna open it up a day early in case some people have to go to work or something. Some people might wanna take it the day before, but it'll be open until midnight on the day that it's due. So in the summer, we're, we're so short, I can't give a whole week because the very next class period, we have to start our next unit of material already. So it's not like in a regular semester where we meet once a week and then I can say, okay, you have seven days to take the test because we're starting the next chapter next week. In the summer, we have to start the next chapter in a day. So that's the only downfall to it. But you, you'll have a couple of day uh, window that the link will be open and you can take the test. All right, so is everybody kind of good to go on what I need you to do immediately from our start here module? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so when it comes to attendance, I, I came in late to the um to the meeting. So you probably edit. All right, Bailey. Yeah, yeah, if you ever come in late, just holler at me. Gotcha. Yeah. So there like, you go. When it, so when it when it comes to like attendance of like the classes, so what if we have to like have to work and we miss the Zoom? So does that get counted? It, it, it's or, fine. It, it, this is on, I only have to keep this attendance to turn it in with my grade book. Nobody can drop you but me. So if I see that you're coming, but then you have to miss, I'm not dropping you. Okay. And besides, after, after June 15th, I can't drop anybody anyway. Instructors can't drop anybody after the census day. So well, that brings me to this point as well. Um, if you have to stop coming or you, whatever, for whatever reason, and you can't participate anymore, you need to make sure you drop yourself because I can't do it after the 15th which means at the end of the semester, if you don't drop yourself, you're gonna wind up with an F. Does, does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right, so let's see, Bailey, see, let me just say this. Uh, Dags, did you come in? Yes, I did, sir. Okay, thank you. Dempsey Marks? No, Sean? All right, what about uh, Sanders? I'm here. Very good, and St. Ann? No, St. Anne. Okay, so I think that means only two of us didn't come. All right, so um, just make sure you get these assignments done up here. For some reason, some people do one, but they don't do the other one. I haven't figured that out yet. I would assume that if you just click on one and you can go straight to the next one, 
but some people they'll do the second one before the first one. I just get both of them. I need both of them done, not just one. All right. All right. So with that said, um, let me pull up our PowerPoint. Unless anybody else has a question, did I hear something? Yes. Um, the wallet code you don't have to purchase it on the lecture, but the lab you do, correct? Okay. So. For the lecture, if you already bought Wiley Plus, you don't have to buy another one. It's good for both AMP1 and AMP2. The lab, though, you have to buy a code because in lab, the code for AMP1 is separate from the code for AMP2 lab. And even if you took the, the lab already and you're retaking the lab, they make you rebuy the code because the code's only good for one semester. It's different for lecture with Wiley Plus. The code is actually good for both AMP1 through AMP2. All right, does anybody else have any questions? Um, do we only get one attempt on the um, the ones, like the, the uh, tests and the quizzes that make up like 20% of the grade? You have three attempts on each, each one. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ashley, no problem. Now, the only ones that you only have one attempt on are our unit tests because we can only take them once. Those are, these are like what would be called your in-class exam if we were in class and oh, we have a test today, this is what that test would be, all right? But all the homework assignments, I set them to where you have three, three chances to go through them, all right? All right, let me pull this up. And can y'all uh, still see my screen? Mm-hmm. Do y'all see the, the PowerPoint? No. No. Y'all don't Not see the yet. PowerPoint, huh? No, sir. Okay, so y'all y'all just still see the, uh, Canvas. the Canvas site. Okay, that means I have to stop sharing and then start sharing again. Hold on. Yeah, that, the reason why I ask you that is because I can switch on my end, but if I don't reshare the screen, for some reason, it doesn't repopulate now can y'all see it yes yes all right very good now uh like i was saying at the beginnings in, in the hybrid course i don't have time to go through every word that's in the powerpoints so you, but you need to make sure that you're reading every slide and you're going through all of the information all right because there's going to be some slides that i have to just skip over but i typically talk about what i skip over from a slide that has a picture on it all right, so let's just get into it. Um, the endocrine system. The endocrine system and the nervous system are the two systems in our body that regulate all physiology. So everything from controlling smooth muscle contraction, digestive function, respiratory function, um, cardiac function, all anything you can think about is regulated by these two systems. The nervous system, as you learned in AMP1, controls physiology by releasing chemicals called neurotransmitters. So if you remember, the neurotransmitters released by a neuron into the synaptic cleft, and we covered all of that in AMP1. We're not going back over that. The endocrine system uh, controls physiology by releasing hormones. And most hormones are secreted into the blood, and the blood circulates them around the body to cells that have receptors for the hormone and cells that have receptors for a particular hormone are just called a target, all right? And then they bring about whatever physiological change that they're trying to induce on that target cell. And we're gonna go over some of those in this chapter. Now, when I updated our PowerPoints, I included the animation and video links. Now you have to be hooked up to the internet to do this. Um, I'm not in presentation mode, but these are hyperlinks that you can click on to view animations and videos. And I think they're really good. So you need to, you need to look at those uh, when you're doing your study and through the PowerPoint. All right, so endocrine glands all produce hormones. There's two types of glands in our body called, they're called endocrine or what you learned in AMP1, they're called exocrine. We're not going back over the exocrine glands, but if you remember like a sweat gland, remember the sudoriferous gland, it has a duct on it. And so the, the sudoriferous gland produces sweat or perspiration and it's transported to the site of action in that duct. 
no endocrine gland has a duct on it. So the way that the endocrine glands get their job done is they secrete the horn, they produce the hormone, and then they secrete it to the outside of the, of the gland cell. And those hormones can, the majority of them get into the blood and the blood transports them around the body. There's a, a couple of examples where that doesn't happen. I'll show you in a second. But then the hormone then diffuses to the targets and bring about the physiological change. I listed a few of the glands down here. This is not everything that we're covering. We're going to cover all of them within in this PowerPoint. Also, I include pictures of where the glands are. On the unit test, you will never have a picture to identify anything. Our unit tests are multiple choice examinations, and I don't put a picture. So it's going to be all text information. But I like to start with this and just show you in general where the major glands are. So if you look up here at the brain, we're gonna cover, this is where we're actually gonna start in a minute. In the brain, there's an area called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is part of the brain, obviously, you learned in AMP1, but it's also part of the endocrine system. So it, the hypothalamus works for both systems. The hypothalamus produces some hormones that regulate the secretion of hormones from this gland, the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland hangs off the bottom of the hypothalamus up in the brain. In your neck, just on side of your Adam's apple in the cervical region or your, your larynx or your voice box is the thyroid gland. So that's where your thyroid gland is located. The thymus gland, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in chapter 22. I mentioned it briefly in this chapter, but we'll, we'll actually cover it more so in chapter 22. Um, lies just superior to the heart. Uh, in the thoracic cavity. On the back of the thyroid gland, if we look at the back of it, you see this picture, there are four little nodules of glandular tissue. Those are called the parathyroids. So that's the parathyroid gland. So we're gonna do all of those glands. We're also gonna cover the pancreas, which in this picture, they kind of take the pancreas out, but this is where the pancreas would be located in the abdominal region. It lies uh, just inferior and posterior to the stomach. So the stomach has been removed from this picture. Um, the adrenal glands, which lie on top of the kidneys. So here's a, the right kidney. This is the left kidney over here. On top of the kidneys are your adrenal glands. We're gonna cover those. And then we're gonna look at briefly the gonads, the ovaries in the female and the testicles in the male, as they make hormones that are gonna be important for regulating physiology. All right, so let me go over some generics with hormone activity. First of all, hormones can only affect a cell that has a receptor that the hormone can bind to. So any cell in the body that has receptors for a particular hormone would be called a target. If a cell does not have a receptor for a hormone, then that cell could never be a target for that hormone. And in which case the hormone could never tell that cell what to do. Because in order for hormones to exert their effects, they have to bind to receptors on the target cell, all right? Now, cells can increase and decrease the number of receptors for a hormone. If they decrease the receptor number, that's called down regulation. If they increase the receptor, number for a hormone is called upregulation. So cells typically down or upregulate depending on the concentrations of hormones in order to maintain a stable sensitivity to the hormone. In other words, if the chemical increases in concentration drastically, the cell may be able to decrease its number of receptors in order to decrease its sensitivity to the hormone and vice versa. So the number of receptors alter the sensitivity of a cell to a particular hormone. So here are the types of classes of hormones that we have. The ones that we're basically going to cover in chapter 18 are going to be what we call circulating hormones. Circulating hormones are also called endocrines. And that's where the name of this system comes from, the endocrine system. The name endocrine is another name 
for generically circulating hormone. So here's a very simple graphic that depicts what a circulating hormone is going to do. Number one, the endocrine gland cell produces the hormone and secretes it via exocytosis to the extracellular fluid. The hormone then diffuses into the blood and the blood becomes the transport vehicle to move the hormone around the body to distant sites to bind to receptors on their distant targets to bring about a physiological change of that particular cell, organ, or tissue. And again, this is just generic information. We're gonna go over the specific hormones uh, in this chapter and their, their roles. So the majority of the ones we're gonna cover are what we call circulating hormones. They circulate around the body, so that's no big deal there. However, we have two other classes of hormones in the body, and these are considered to be what we call local hormones. They're called local hormones because the gland cell that produces the hormone does not, the hormone does not get into the blood and circulate around the body. The gland cell simply secretes the hormone outside of itself and then the hormone diffuses to neighboring cells in the case of what we call a paracrine. So an endocrine gland cell that produces a local hormone that affects a neighboring cell would be called a paracrine cell. And a paracrine cell produces the local hormone, which would be called a paracrine. The most obscure type of local hormone is what we call an autocrine. Autocrines are hormone molecules that are produced by the autocrine cell. It secretes the hormone outside of itself, but what is kind of strange is that it binds to receptors on the surface of itself. Now, there's only a couple of examples of these autocrines. We're gonna cover uh, one of them, two of them when we get to chapter 22. I'll just give you an ex for instance. In the immune system, our immune system cells are stimulated in such a way that they secrete molecules that bind to receptors on themselves. And when they do that, it causes this cell to undergo a massive amount of mitosis. Basically, it clones itself into an army of cells that can then go around the body and eradicate the pathogen that's making you sick. So that is an example of an autocrine. It deals with the immune system, right? Now, what they don't show on here is there's another signal molecule that would have to bind to it first, and then it causes the cell to produce its own hormone. That's what's kind of strange about it. But for this test, it's fine. Uh, you know, I might have a question on there. Basically, what the definition is, if, do you know a paracrine is a local hormone that affects neighboring cells? And do you know that an autocrine is a local hormone that affects the cell that produced it to begin with, something like that, all right? Because we have a lot of other information that's gonna be more important to get to than just some of this generic information, all right? Now, I also want you to know the groups of hormones that are called lipid soluble and water soluble, which I'll show you on the next slide, next two slides. But lipid soluble hormones don't like water. They like fat. They like lipids. So anything that you already know, anything that, that likes oil does not like water because oil and water don't mix, right? So the plasma membranes on all the cells in the body are made of lipids. And so lipid-soluble hormones then can diffuse right through the lipid bilayer of its target. Water-soluble hormones, though, can't do that. Since water-soluble hormones are soluble in water, that means they like water, they don't like fat or lipids. So the water-soluble hormones cannot diffuse through the surface of the cell. So depending on if the hormone is lipid-soluble or water-soluble will directly determine what type of receptor the hormone can bind to on the target. And I'm gonna show you examples of them in a second. So here are the lipid-soluble hormones. I want you to know the classes of them. All steroid hormones are lipid soluble. You don't have to memorize these structures. This just represents a steroid hormone right here. If you don't know what, I'm sure you heard of cholesterol before. These four rings right here, this four ring structure, that is cholesterol. 
all steroid hormones are made from modifying a cholesterol molecule, by the way. And cholesterol basically is a fat without fatty acids on it. But so all steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen, some that you already know, even vitamin D becomes a steroid hormone because vitamin D is produced from cholesterol. If you didn't know that all of those are fat soluble, lipid soluble thyroid hormones, at least T3 and T4, those particular thyroid hormones are fat soluble. And then a molecule that acts as a signal molecule, I'm calling it a hormone here. It's actually a gas like oxygen, molecular oxygen is a gas, CO2, carbon dioxide is a gas, nitric oxide is a gas. So this is a gas molecule that acts as a signal molecule in our body. It's kind of interesting. One of its primary effects is to bring about vasodilation and increase blood flow to tissues. So all of these are fat soluble. Water soluble hormones include all of the hormones that are produced from amino acids. And any hormone that is made from an amino acid would be called an amine or a biogenic amine. And so you already know a few of these like epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, you might have remember from AMP1 serotonin because we covered that as a neurotransmitter. Um, you might know histamine if you have allergies uh, because you take Benadryl, which is a histamine blocker for allergies. But epinephrine and norepinephrine are the ones that students remember the most from AMP1. And this group of, of hormones are referred to as the catecholamines. There are modified amino acids, which means they're water soluble. All peptide or protein hormones, here they show oxytocin. Probably remember that one from AMP1. This is the one that brings about labor contraction, if you remember that. So since this is a protein hormone, it's water soluble. So the majority of the hormones that we cover are pretty much proteins or peptides or biogenic amines, not all of them. Uh, we're gonna cover a bunch of the steroids. Uh, these are all water soluble. What the oddball here is the cosinoids. This is the one that you probably don't know what they are. Um, these are these are prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Prostaglandins and leukotrienes are involved in immune responses and inflammatory responses and allergy attacks. Um, prostaglandins also induce pain. For instance, if you have a headache and you take aspirin, aspirin blocks the enzyme that produces prostaglandins. Um, if you have allergies and you take Zyrtec, Zyrtec blocks the production of leukotrienes. Now there's a whole bunch of different ones of these, a whole bunch. There, there's not just one, there's a whole bunch of them. But nonetheless, they are water soluble hormones. So why are we learning the groups of hormones that are water soluble or fat soluble? Well, we have to know what types of receptors they bind to and how the hormones are going to affect the cell. So let's say just generically, hormones bind to a receptor on a cell. What types of generic physiological changes can take place? Well, in some cases, a hormone can tell a cell to make new molecules. They can synthesize new molecules, increase molecule production in the cell. Some cells change their permeability in the cell membrane for particular ions to cross. And I'm gonna give you a real example of one of those in a minute. So you can either increase or decrease the permeability of cell membranes to the movements of substances across the membrane. You can increase or decrease endo and exocytosis, if you remember those names, basically transporting substances in and out of the cell via endo and exocytosis. You can alter the rate of metabolic reactions um, like everybody kind of remembers aerobic respiration from general biology and you probably hated learning like all the reactions of glycolysis and whatnot. There are some hormones that can increase the reaction rates of aerobic respiration. So your cells can make ATP more quickly. So we can change how fast chemistry occurs in the cell. And then lastly, but not least hormones can regulate smooth muscle and cardiac muscle contraction. Now, I know I put here causes contraction, but some hormones can also cause relaxation of smooth muscle. Um, so 
sometimes we can increase the contraction of it. Sometimes we decrease the contraction of it. Just depends on what hormone we're talking about. So let's look at generically how hormones can affect the cell. And then I'll give you a real example of them. So here's why we have to know which cells are lipid soluble and which cell, I mean, which hormones are lipid soluble and which ones are water soluble. If we have a lipid soluble hormone, that means that it likes lipids and it doesn't like water. And the problem with that is that our blood is mainly water. There's a whole bunch of water in our blood. So the majority of lipid soluble hormones, like all the steroids, are transported in the blood via a transport protein. So the transport protein basically allows that steroid or other lipid soluble hormone to be effectively transported in the blood. When the hormone approaches its target tissue, it diffuses out of the blood. And since it's fat soluble, it diffuses directly across the plasma membrane and it goes directly into the cell to tell the inside of the cell what to do. Now, invariably, the majority of the lipid soluble hormones in some form or fashion alter gene activity in the nucleus. And what I mean to say by that is they can either increase gene activity or they can decrease gene activity, which then directly alters how quickly the cells make new proteins. All right. So if we increase gene activity without going through transcription and translation again, which I'm not doing, but we increase transcription, we then increase translation by the ribosome, you make a new protein. So let me give you an example of this. Everybody knows testosterone a little bit, I'm sure. And you probably are familiar with the fact that some bodybuilders shoot up testosterone in order to get muscles bigger quicker, get stronger quicker. So how does that happen and why does that happen anyway? Well, testosterone is what we call an anabolic steroid. Anabolic means you build protein or you build molecules. So let's say this was testosterone. Testosterone would go across the membrane of the muscle cell. It would then bind to its receptor, which is invariably a DNA binding protein. So when it binds to its receptor, it forms a complex that has the ability to turn the genes on in the nucleus. So testosterone basically turns the gene on, which makes the cell make more muscle protein, in which case the cell gets bigger with protein and stronger. So that's how anabolic steroids work. So that's a pretty direct effect. Lipid soluble hormones have a direct effect on cells by altering gene activity. So this is the easiest of the two cases. Lipid soluble hormones diffuse directly in the cell and tell the cell to do something, right? Now, water soluble hormones, much different. Water soluble hormones, number one, can just be transported in the watery blood without a transport protein because they, let's face it, they dissolve in water. The problem with that though, is that the water soluble hormone cannot get directly in the cell to tell the cell to do anything. So what it has to do is water soluble hormones are always destined to bind to what we call a cell surface receptor. See this little brown square up here? It's embedded in the membrane of the cell, the plasma membrane. We always call that a cell surface receptor. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. The receptors on the insides of cells are called intracellular receptors. So in this case, you see the intracellular receptors found in a nucleus, but they can also be found out here in the cytoplasm. So either way, the, the receptors that are inside of the cell are just called intracellular. So here we have a cell surface receptor. The water soluble hormone is going to bind to it. And since the water soluble hormone can't tell the inside of the cell to do anything directly, we have to change the chemistry in some way in here to produce another molecule that tells the cell what to do. So ultimately, this is what we call a second messenger system. And all biology books and A&P books all teach the same second messenger system, which is called 
the cyclic AMP second messenger system. That's what this is right here. C-A-M-P stands for cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP becomes what we call the second messenger and it works this way. The hormone would be called the first message. It binds to the cell surface receptor. The, the hormone receptor complex then turns on something called a G protein. That's a little blue thing you see in the picture. The G protein is a relay messenger. It relays the message from the activated receptor to an enzyme, in this case called adenylyl or adenylate cyclase. So when the G protein is activated, it turns on and activates adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase does one thing all day long when it's activated. It converts ATP into the second messenger molecule, cyclic AMP. So now cyclic AMP levels start to rise in the cell. The concentration goes up. And as the concentration of cyclic AMP goes up, it turns on another group of enzymes called protein kinases. Protein kinase is a generic name. There's a whole bunch of different ones. And when a protein kinase is activated, they too do one thing all day long when they're activated. They remove, activated protein kinases, remove a phosphate group from ATP and they stick it onto a substrate molecule in the cell. So you see here, the su just generic substrate called a protein. After the protein kinase does its job, the protein has this little phosphate group added to it. So this little phosphate group is what's important. Inside of a cell, when molecules are turned on or turned off, because they're not always just on, they're, they're turned on or they're turned off by the addition or removal of phosphate groups. So when a phosphate group gets added to a molecular substrate on the inside of the cell, that's called phosphorylation. So protein kinases phosphorylate substrates. That's how we verbalize that. In some cases, the substrate is turned on. In other cases, it's turned off. In which case, if you're turning on or turning off chemistry on the inside of the cell, you're changing what the cell does physiologically. Now, I know that's all generic, so I'm gonna give you a quick example of something that you can relate to, all right? So this is the generic setup for the sequence of events on how a water-soluble hormone alters the activity of its target. So I want you to go through one, two, three, four, five, six, all of these steps so you know the order in which everything is occurring. So let me go through a real example because it's kind of arbitrary right now. Let's say this water-soluble hormone is adrenaline. Epinephrine is water-soluble. Epinephrine is produced by the adrenal medulla that's in our packet. So epinephrine will have to always bind to a cell surface receptor. When it binds to the cell surface receptor, it turns it on. When that receptor is turned on, it turns on a G protein. When that G protein is turned on, it activates adenylate cyclase, just like we see here. So the example that I'm giving you deals with adrenaline or epinephrine, and we're gonna say the target cell is your cardiac muscle cell, your heart. So everybody knows at least one thing that happens when you have an adrenaline rush, I bet. Your heart rate goes up, part of our adrenaline rush, right? Or what you learned in AMP1 is a fight or flight response. Oh, my heart rate's going up. So why does that happen? Well, in your heart, we have a pacemaker, and those pacemakers have receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline compounds basically. And when epinephrine binds, or norepinephrine for that matter, binds to their receptor on your pacemaker cell, it turns on the G protein, which activates adenylate cyclase, which produces cyclic AMP from ATP, 
As cyclic AMP levels rise in the cell, it turns on protein kinases that then phosphorylate a substrate. Except in this case, the actual uh, molecule that's being phosphorylated be is an, a calcium channel that's embedded in the membrane. I know they don't show that, but it's a calcium channel. Let's say there's a calcium channel right here. It has a doorway on it called the gate. And if that channel, channel gets a phosphate group added to it, the calcium channel opens and calcium starts to flood the inside of the cell, which makes the cell fire more quickly and your heart rate goes up. Also, the other types of cells in your heart are called contractile fibers, and they too are affected by adrenaline. So not only does your heart rate go up in an adrenaline rush, but the force of contraction of your heart also increases to help increase blood flow. So in those contractile fibers, the calcium channels open, they become phosphorylated when adrenaline is bound to the receptor and calcium starts to flood the inside of the cell, which makes the cell contract harder than it normally would. Kind of interesting, huh? So that's how epinephrine is affecting your heart. And for that matter, that's how epinephrine is affecting pretty much all of its targets in the body because epinephrine has to act via a second messenger system. Now there's over a hundred different types of second messenger systems, right? That's what I got my postgraduate degrees in, what you're looking at here and I publish papers in this. So there's a whole bunch of them. We're learning just one. We're learning and you need to know the steps of them, all right, how that happens. All right, so let's get into uh, the last bit of introductory material and then start on our glands. As far as hormone actions are concerned, I want you to read through what contributes to how responsive a target cell is. Now, if you were in lab yesterday, I kind of hinted on this in my book that we covered. If you're not in my lab, uh, you could just learn it from here, it's fine. If you have any questions on it, just email me. Um, a hormone's uh, concentration in the blood, whether it's high or low, can affect the responsiveness of a target. If the concentration goes up, the, the, the cell is more responsive. If the concentration is lower, then the cell is less responsive. The cell itself can change the number of receptors, as I mentioned earlier. If they upregulate receptors, the cell becomes more responsive. If they downregulate receptors, they become less responsive. Um, other hormones can influence target cells as well. So if we have multiple hormones acting on the same target, uh, we call it something different depending on what the response is. For instance, we can have two different hormones in the body that affect targets to bring about similar responses in the body in which case we would call that a synergistic effect. In Latin, S-Y-N means the same. So they basically have a similar effect. They don't have to have the exact same effect, but you might have two different hormones that both increase your blood sugar, in which case I would call those hormones synergistic. On the other hand, if we have two hormones that bring about opposite effects, then I would say they're antagonistic. So let's say we have two different hormones, which we're gonna cover them, that one of them increases blood calcium, but the other one decreases blood calcium. I would call them antagonistic because they bring about opposite effects. All right, so let's go through the generics of how hormones, how the glands in the body know when they're supposed to release their hormone. I mean, you probably never thought about it before, but our hormone levels fluctuate increase and decrease at different times due to varying types of stimulation. We produce some hormones more at night. We produce more, some hormones more during the day. We produce some hormones based on what types of food we eat. We produce hormones if we see light, if we see darkness, all sorts of different stimuli, right? So let's go over some of the generics of what we call hormone regulation, control of hormone regulation secretion. Here's a negative feedback loop. Most hormones are gonna be regulated that we cover on a negative feedback loop. And the example that they show here 
is the example of how the adrenal cortex, this is the adrenal gland down here, how the adrenal cortex produces a group of hormones called glucocorticoids, basically cortisol, all right? So how does the adrenal cortex know when to release glucocorticoids? Well, in this case, it's pretty simple. The negative feedback loop is based on the concentration of the hormone itself in the blood. So in other words, if the level of the glucocorticoids is high, you don't have to make it because you have enough of them. However, if glucocorticoid levels start to fall in concentration in the blood, then we know we need to make it. So let's say that happens. Glucocorticoid levels start to decline in the blood. There is, or are I should say, receptors in the brain that can detect when the glucocorticoid levels drop. So some stress or stimulus starts to decrease the glucocorticoid concentration in the blood. And so the glucocorticoid level is what we call the controlled condition. The receptors are located in the hypothalamus. So here's a, here's a simple diagram of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland hanging off of it. So we have cells, what we call neurosecretory cells or neuroendocrine cells in the hypothalamus that detect a drop in glucocorticoid level. So what do they do? The hypothalamus produces a hormone which tells the pituitary gland to release a hormone. And that hormone tells the adrenal cortex to produce glucocorticoids. So we have a stepwise system of hormone action. So let's start at the top. Glucocorticoid levels fall. The hypothalamus says, yep, glucocorticoid levels fell. We need to make some glucocorticoids. So what does it do? It releases a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. Corticotropin releasing hormone. Corticotropin releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus and its target is in the anterior pituitary gland. Specifically cells called corticotrophs. So the corticotrophs have receptors for corticotropin releasing hormone. In the presence of corticotropin releasing hormone, the corticotrophs release adrenocorticotropic hormone, or what we call ACTH. I know it's a big, long, weird word, and students hate it, but you have to learn the names of the hormones and their abbreviations. So you need to keep a notebook on that. So what does adrenocorticotropic hormone do? Hmm. Well, luckily for us, the name kind of gives away its, its function. Adrenocortico means the adrenal cortex. Tropic hormone implies that the hormone affects another gland. A tropic hormone is a hormone that affects another gland in the body. So I can also call it a tropin hormone, tropin. If I say tropic, I say hormone after it. If I say tropin, you don't have to say hormone after it. So adrenocorticotropic hormone affects the adrenal cortex, specifically the middle zone of the adrenal cortex, which is called the zona fasciculata. That's how you say that, the zona fasciculata. So that means the fasciculata cells in the adrenal cortex has receptors for, you guessed it, adrenocorticotropic hormone. So adrenocorticotropic hormone binds to receptors on the zona fasciculata cells. Oh, and this is a water-soluble hormone, by the way. It's a uh, protein hormone. So it's binding to cell surface receptors on the fasciculata cells. And so it causes the fasciculata cells to produce groups of hormones called glucocorticoids. And now we're gonna learn all of this when we get to the adrenal gland. This, this is here to teach you that we have negative feedback loops that control the secretions of hormones. So this loop is gonna run 
and run and run until the end resulting hormone, in this case, the glucocorticoids, increases back to normal concentrations. So that when glucocorticoid levels increase in concentration, the loop is automatically going to turn off because the receptors say, hey, we have enough glucocorticoids. So they stop releasing CRH. In the absence of CRH, the anterior pituitary gland stops releasing ACTH. In the absence of ACTH, the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex stops releasing, you guessed it, glucocorticoids. Until the level of glucocorticoid level drops again, the loop will turn back on. So this is a negative feedback loop. Many of the hormones are controlled via negative loops. So we have, you know, little animations that you can look at here. And I, uh, I urge you to do that. All of the animations and video links that I put in the PowerPoint. All right, I know you're tired, but I'm, I'm gonna keep going so we can get into our glands. Um, so what we're gonna start with first, and I'm gonna show you where you need a study before some people have to leave. Um, some people might have another class. Um, with the tables that we have in here. We're gonna start our, with our gland discussion with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So just to let you know, the hypothalamus is nervous tissue, but it also, which functions in the nervous system, but it also functions in the endocrine system because the hypothalamus produces hormones that control the anterior portion of the pituitary gland. So here's a, a real, uh, diagram of a pituitary gland. The pituitary gland has two portions to it. It has a posterior portion, which is simply called the posterior pituitary or neurohypothesis, and an anterior pituitary, which is called the adenohypothesis. Now, the anterior pituitary gland makes up the majority of the gland by weight, but you don't have to go memorize 75%. I'm not worried about that. But we do need to know the cell types in the anterior uh, gland or anterior adenohypothesis, and we have to know the seven hormones that they make. We then are gonna learn the two hormones that are released from the neurohypothesis, because the neurohypothesis does not produce any hormone, but it releases two of them. And lastly, we're gonna be learning all of the hypothalamic hormones that regulate the adenohypothesis. So where do you learn all of that from? Well, there's a couple of pictures in here and some tables, right? So let me just show you. The anterior pituitary gland contains five different cell types. Now we're not identifying them, but you have to know them by name and we have to know what they secrete. So there are, and all the cell names end in troph, somatotroph, thyrotroph, gonadotroph, so forth and so on. Now their name sometimes gives away a little bit about what hormone they make. So somatotrophs produce human growth hormone, which in our book, they just put growth hormone since we are obviously studying human anatomy and physiology. We don't have to sit there and say human growth hormone. However, on my test, I was old school. I put either HGH, which stands for human growth hormone, or I just wrote it out, human growth hormone. So whenever you see GH or growth hormone, it's the same as human growth hormone or HGH, right? The thyrotrophs produce a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone. Gonadotrophs actually produce two hormones, which are called the gonadotropins, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Lactotrophs produce one hormone. They're, it's called prolactin, and you could probably guess as to what its role is in the body. It causes lactation in part in the female reproductive system. So the, the mammary glands can produce milk for the baby. Um, and then the corticotrophs. I know they only show one hormone here, but technically the corticotrophs produce two hormones. 
It produces melanocyte stimulating hormone to a lesser degree. But the one that we're physiologically interested in is the one that I just mentioned off of that negative feedback loop, adrenocorticotropic hormone. All right. Now, all five of these cell types are regulated by hormones that are released by the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus is nervous tissue. It's made up of neurons like you learned about in AMP1. Except in this case, these neurons produce molecules that actually get into the blood, in which case they're called hormones. So these are the neurosecretory cells or neuroendocrine cells that allow the hypothalamus to be part of the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus produces two types of hormones. They either produce a hormone that would be called a releasing hormone or hormones that are called inhibiting hormones. The hormones that are called something, something releasing hormone would cause their target in the anterior pituitary gland to go ahead and release their hormone. On the other hand, if the hormone is whatever something, something inhibiting hormone, it would inhibit the gland cell in the anterior pituitary from releasing its hormone. So the releasing hormones cause the anterior gland to release their hormone. The inhibiting hormones block the release of their hormone. So where do we get that information from? Well, right here, all in one nice, neat little place. Here's the hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. Here's the cell type. Here's the cell type that makes the hormone. And here are the hypothalamic hormones that regulate this cell type. So for instance, well, and I want you to go through and make sure you know this table. For instance, go through this example. The hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone. And I'm going to show you when and why that happens. But if it releases growth hormone releasing hormone, which is abbreviated GHRH, stands for growth hormone releasing hormone, then the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland are going to produce and release human growth hormone. If, however, your hypothalamus is releasing growth hormone inhibiting hormone, which is also called somatostatin, GHIH, that hormone prevents the somatotrophs from producing human growth hormone. So the releasing hormones cause for the release of the cell's hormone and the inhibiting hormone blocks the release of that cell's hormone. Not too terribly difficult. But we have to know at certain times when and where the hormones are being released. And we're going to cover some of that. All right. So I have the examples for the releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones that control the five cell types and if the hormone will be released or not. So let's go over another negative feedback loop. This is a, another diagram that graphically shows what we already learned from this negative feedback loop up here. It's just another diagram depicting what's going on along with the hypothalamus and the green arrows show an activation, the red arrows show an inhibitory feedback. So in this case, the hypothalamus would release corticotropin releasing hormone that binds to the corticotrophs in the anterior gland that causes them to release adrenocorticotropic hormone that causes the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex to release the glucocorticoids, and the main one is called cortisol. So this would keep happening as long as cortisol levels are kind of low. But as cortisol levels begin to rise, the hypothalamus stops releasing CRH. 
which blocks the release of ACTH, which then blocks the release of cortisol. So this is why it's a negative feedback loop. Let's talk about human growth hormone though. Human growth hormone is a very powerful hormone in our body. It is the hormone that they call the holy grail of anti-aging, by the way. It has some very powerful effects in our body. We could spend a whole semester on this one hormone. There's so many effects. But let's go over some of its generics right now. First of all, human growth hormone is controlled, well, the release of it from somatotrophs is controlled by hypothalamic hormones. Growth hormone, releasing hormone, and growth hormone, inhibiting hormone. So let's look at how that happens. So growth hormone, human growth hormone is regulated in part by the types of foods that you consume. So if you look at the top, hypoglycemia is when you don't have enough sugar in your blood. I'm sure everybody knows that one. So if your sugar levels are falling in your blood, it would stimulate growth hormone releasing hormone to be released from the hypothalamus. Same thing if you eat a meal that's rich in fats or, or protein. Or if your blood levels of free amino acids increase. Or if you're undergoing a fight or flight response, you learned about in AMP1, the sympathetic responses. Or when you are under deep sleep, you release human growth hormone. And in the presence of testosterone in males or estrogen in females and thyroid hormone increases the release of GHRH. So all of these are stimulators for the release of growth hormone, releasing hormone. But one of the principal ones I wanna focus on for this discussion is hypoglycemia. Because I'm sure everybody knows about those low carb diets or those keto diets. That's the, that's the you know, slang term everybody started learning like a year ago or so, but they really don't know what keto means. So I'm gonna talk about that briefly here. So let's say that you haven't eaten or had anything to drink yet today that has sugar in it, all right? So like I drink my coffee black and all of that. So I haven't had any sugar yet. So I'm working on the meals that I ate last night. Oh, I see it's, it's time to go to your next class. If you guys have to leave the room, you can. I know I, I, I went over, I wasn't looking at the time. Um, but I'm going to continue for a little bit. I probably won't get through every one of these slides. I'll, I'm going to go through it at least half of them though, and then we'll pick back up next week. And if you do have to leave the room, just go through and, and view the video link. After the Zoom notifies me that the link is completed, then I'm going to post it in our Canvas site. All right. But if you don't have another class and you can stay, I'm only going to go for about another 20 minutes or so. All right. All right. So. Um, if you haven't eaten any sugar yet today, then your hypothalamus is releasing this hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone, which stimulates the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary gland to release human growth hormone. Human growth hormone has many effects in our body. And some of those effects in our body cause for an increase in blood sugar. Um, in a couple of ways. Number one, you see down here some of the targets, and the liver is one of them. So human growth hormone has many effects. One of them is to target your liver and tells the liver to either release sugar to the blood, because that's where we store sugar, or tells the liver to make a new sugar. So that's called either glycogenolysis, if we break down sugar stores in the blood, or gluconeogenesis if the liver makes a new sugar. So my point is this, human growth hormone causes the liver to release sugar. The stimulating factor was hypoglycemia. So one of its responses is to reverse that original stressor up here. You don't have enough sugar, so let's release some sugar. So on the other hand, if you eat, let's say you're drinking a Coke, which basically is liquid sugar, 12 tea, teaspoons of sugar in that Coke, uh, or you're eating a candy bar, has a lot of sugar in it. Those are high glycemic food index items that spikes your blood sugar. So you get hyperglycemia all of a sudden, or your blood sugar goes up. 
that causes the hypothalamus to release growth hormone inhibiting hormone, which blocks the somatotrophs from releasing growth hormone. In the absence of growth hormone, you decrease the effects on its targets, which means the liver stops releasing sugar in the blood. All right. Now, ultimately, growth hormone is going to have multiple effects in our body. I'm going to go over a couple of them on the next slide. Now, you know, growth hormone affects our sugar levels in our blood, right? The other thing that it does, though, which is amazing about growth hormone, is that growth hormone can target your adipose tissue and tells your adipocytes to break down fat. So if you don't consume sugar, you release more growth hormone. Also, if you don't consume a lot of sugar, you stop releasing as much insulin. And so together, those two hormones, along with a few other ones, makes people lose weight when they get on a low carb diet, because they're basically always inducing a hypoglycemic event in their body. So growth hormone makes you shed some fat off, but it also strengthens your bone, increases your muscle mass, and causes your cartilage to be healthy and strong, along with other tissues in the body. Human growth hormone is what the name implies. It causes for body-wide growth, repair, and reproduction of tissues and cells in the body. It keeps us young, active. It keeps us healthy. As we get older, we produce less of it, and it brings on some of the signs of aging. Um, so let's go to the next chart, since I know you all are getting tired and you might have other things to do. Here is a chart of the, the hormones from the hypothalamus. It then shows the tar some of the main targets of the hormones. I'm not putting the pictures on the test, but you have to know their targets by name, obviously. Um, human growth hormone targets more than just the liver. However, you can read over here, it affects muscle and cartilage and bone, all of that. So make sure you read through some of the principal effects of each one of these hormones and what they're doing, all right? All right, so before I stop for today, I wanna to get through at least the posterior pituitary gland and their two hormones and really introduce um, the thyroid gland, which will be the next gland. So let's talk about the posterior pituitary gland. It's not all that difficult and it's not, it doesn't take too long to go through it. The posterior pituitary gland is not a gland at all. It's actually an outgrowth of the brain from the hypothalamus, it's nervous tissue. And so what we have here is what we call the neurohypothesis. It does not produce any hormone, but it releases two. The hormones are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. These two hormones are produced way up here in the hypothalamus, right? So the cell bodies of these neurons that you learned about in AMP1, remember neurons have a cell body and axons and axon terminals. The cell bodies are clustered in places called a nucleus in the brain. So they're clustered in two places, something called the paraventricular nucleus. The, that means they lie on the side of those lateral ventricles uh, and just on either side of the third ventricle that you learned about in AMP1. And then something called the supraoptic nucleus, and it's called that because it lies right above, right here, which is called the optic chiasm. But nonetheless, just know these two names. This is where the hormones are made, the paraventricular nucleus and the supraoptic nucleus. You don't have to know exactly where they're located. So these hormones are released from the posterior pituitary gland. So what do they do? Well, the oxytocin targets the uterus and the mammary glands in a female reproductive system. You should remember from AMP1 that oxytocin brings about labor contraction so the baby can be born. It also brings about milk ejection from the mammary glands so the baby can eat. So there's several different hormones that work on the mammary glands. Some of them cause the mammary gland to produce the milk. 
Well, oxytocin makes the mammary gland release the milk from the nipple when the baby's trying to eat. A physical reflex, it's called a mechanosensitive reflex, when the baby is suckling on the nipple, it stimulates the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. Now, antidiuretic hormone, we're gonna actually learn this hormone three different times this semester. That's how important this hormone is. This is our water conservation hormone. It's an antidiuretic hormone. So you probably know that diuretics make you go to the bathroom if you take a diuretic. Caffeine acts as a diuretic. It makes your kidneys dump water out into what will become urine. So diuretics make you lose water from your blood, in which case they bring your blood volume down but make sure urinary output volume go up. Antidiuretics, like antidiuretic hormone, targets the kidney and tells the kidney, hey, let's save all the water we can and put it back in the blood where it came from. In which case, we would decrease the volume of urine that we make, but we would increase blood volume. So here's why that's important, that we're going to learn in three different chapters. Blood volume, the amount of water in your blood, is directly related to your blood pressure. So in other words, if blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up. If blood volume goes down, your blood pressure goes down. And that's why the first round of medical therapy to treat hypertension, the doctor typically puts you on a diuretic. They make you go to the bathroom to dump water out that decreases your blood volume and hopefully decreases your blood pressure. Now, antidiuretic hormone also targets certain small arteries in the body called arterioles, and it brings about a decrease in their diameter. So antidiuretic hormone is also what we call a vasoconstrictor. It brings about vasoconstriction which helps increase our blood pressure. So in both of these ways, ADH is trying to help increase your blood pressure. So let's say you have a patient and they're bleeding out. They, they're, or if you have a patient that's really sick, they vom severe vomiting, severe diarrhea, they're losing water that way. Anything that makes you lose water from the blood, severe sweating, uh, or bleeding out directly, hemorrhage, makes your blood volume go down, it makes your blood pressure go down. ADH would try and bring your pressure back up by targeting the kidneys. Hey, let's save some water in the blood. And also targeting the arterioles to bring about vasoconstriction. And when we vasoconstrict blood vessels in the body, that helps increase our pressure. So we're going to learn about these concepts at least three different times this semester, and we're going to get into them a little bit more in, in this chapter. All right. So you can see here, I put a slide for oxytocin. Make sure you read through what happens at uh, the uterus and the, the mammary gland. I put here a little bit more about oxytocin and how we regulate it. I think I have a feedback loop in here as well that I'm going to show you. Um, but I need to define this term. How does the hypothalamus up here know when to release ADH is the whole point. Well, the neuroendocrine cells up here are sensitive to the level of water that's in the blood or the concentration of solutes in the blood. So if someone is severely dehydrated, let's say they don't, you already know that they don't have water in the blood if you're dehydrated, right? So if you're dehydrated, you don't have water, but you still have all those molecules, solutes, and ions in the blood. So those molecules in the blood increase in concentration because you're losing your water. Well, when we increase the concentrations of solutes in our blood, that makes your blood become hypertonic, if you remember that term from general biology. So remember, we had hypotonic and we had hy hypertonic and isotonic, and that concept was to describe to you how water moves from one location to another one. Water always moves from where there's more water to where there's less water. So it will always move from a hypotonic into a hypertonic solution. So I don't have time to go back over all of that. However, 
in our blood, we use the term osmolarity and osmolality. They are typically used interchangeably, although they're slightly different. But the osmolarity of our blood is supposed to stay about the same. However, in a person that is moderately to severely dehydrated, their concentration in the blood of solutes goes up, which means their osmolarity goes up, which means any cell, specifically up here, that can respond to an increase in osmolarity would be called an osmoreceptor. Osmoreceptors monitor the concentration of our blood. And if the blood is too concentrated, it means you're dehydrated. In which case, it causes for the release of ADH. So when your blood volume levels increase, you're overhydrated, and we don't need ADH put out. Yes, you can be overhydrated. Or if you're dehydrated, you don't have enough blood volume, then we want ADH to be produced. That's what I put these two statements in there for. I also have a slide that shows the hormone and its targets and the control of its secretion, what I want you to go over, and their principal actions in the body. So you need to review that uh, pretty much today. All right, so the last thing that I wanna mention, I'm not gonna go over everything about the thyroid gland, I just wanna tell you where it's at. Um, and a couple of things about how the thyroid hormones are made, and we're gonna call it a day because I know you're tired. The thyroid gland is a bilobed gland that's located just inferior and lateral uh, to your larynx. Here's your larynx up here, your voice box. Here's your trachea, your windpipe, and the thyroid gland lies on the side of it. The thyroid gland has two different types of cell types that you have to learn about. One of the cell types is called a follicular cell, excuse me, or a thyroid follicular cell. And the thyroid follicular cells produce T3 and T4. T3 is called triiodothyronine. That's how you say that. And T4 is called tetraiodothyronine. So look at what these are, T4, T3, tetra means four. Iodo means iodine. And the Latin term for thyroid hormones, you guessed it, is called theranine. So T4 is a thyroid hormone that has four iodines on it. T3 is a thyroid hormone that has three iodines on it. Tri means three, right? The parafollicular cells are the cells that produce calcitonin. Now, calcitonin is different from T3 and T4. T3 and T4 are lipid soluble. That means they bind to intracellular receptors. And calcitonin is water soluble. It's a protein hormone. Now, calcitonin helps regulate calcium uh, in the blood. And we're going to cover that when we get to the parathyroid glands next Tuesday when we have class. But here is a little diagram. We're not identifying this on the test that shows a cross section through the thyroid gland. It would look like this. There are these thyroid follicles, fluid filled spheres in the, in the gland. In the middle, it's filled with something called thyroglobulin, which is a thick protein matrix called the colloid. This helps make T3 and T4. The cells that line the follicle directly are called the follicular cells. And so those are the cells that make T3 and T4. The cells that lie on the outside of the follicle, which are not part of the follicular wall directly, those are called parafollicular cells, and those are the cells that make calcitonin, right? Now, what I want you to do... Quick question, oh, Professor. Okay, go ahead. Was that a simple cuboidal cell? Very good. Those are cuboidal cells, correct. In fact, I forgot to tell you all that, but the majority of the endocrine glands in the body, the glandular cells themselves are typically cuboidal in nature. There are some exceptions to that rule because there are some tissues and organs in the body that make 
hormones that are not considered to be an endocrine gland per se, but they actually release hormones. I'm going to cover some of those at the end of the packet. And some of those hormones, like your stomach, can make some hormones for us. But the cells are not, you know, completely just square like a cuboid. It's a modified cuboidal or small columnar. But that's neither here nor there. All right, so let me tell you what you're looking at with this picture. This picture shows you the steps that are important in the production of T3 and T4 hormones. So I'm gonna run through them very quickly. It's not too difficult. I think I have one question or two on the test, that's it. But the reason why I put this in here is because of a couple of reasons. One, the thyroid gland, the follicular cell specifically, this represents a follicular cell. So this thing right here represents one of these cuboidal cells. So let's say it would be from that picture over there, it would be this one down here. All right. If I look at it, then again, above the cell is where the colloid is, but below the cell is where the capillaries, the blood vessels would be. All right. So let's look at it again. So on a real picture, it would be this cell down here. So above it is where the, this colloid's at. Below it are where the capillaries for the blood vessels would be. So how do the follicular cells make T3 and T4 anyway? Well, the follicular cells are the only cells in our body that utilize iodine. The only reason why we need iodine in our diet to live is to make T3 and T4 hormones. In the absence of iodine, you cannot make T3 and T4, in which case you've probably heard of the word goiter before. Uh, simple goiters are nutritional deficits of iodine. We don't really have those problems anymore because back in the late 40s and 50s, the government started adding iodine to your salt, all right? So ultimately, iodine is transported in the blood in an ion form. It's a negative ion called iodide. Just like you have chloride, right? You heard of that before? You have iodide. So what stimulates the follicular cell to make T3 and T4. Well, next week we're gonna learn it's thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone from the thyrotrophs of the anterior pituitary gland would circulate down to the, the hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone would circulate down to its target, which is this cell. So that thyroid stimulating hormone increases the uptake of iodide. So we take up more iodide from the blood. Number two, thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the follicular cell to make this protein, thyroglobulin, TGB. Thyroglobulin is a protein that's made of amino acids. And the only amino acid that I'm interested in in the whole globular protein is tyrosine. And because tyrosine residues bond together to make T3 and T4. So the iodine is taken up from the blood, it's called iodide trapping. We synthesize thyroglobulin with tyrosine residues on it. That is exocytosed out into the colloid, the follicle lumen. This globular protein has a whole bunch of tyrosine residues on it that start to pair up in groups of two. More than that, these groups of two tyrosine residues get iodine stuck on them. And so there's a hormone called peroxidase. They don't show it, but it takes two of these iodide ions and binds them together and it forms iodine. So iodine is a, doesn't have a charge on it, just like chlorine doesn't have a charge on it, but chloride is a negative ion. So iodine, which you see here, this I0, gets stuck onto the tyrosine residues. I know you can barely see that, but this little thing represents a tyrosine. Some tyrosine residues get two eyes stuck on it and some only get one. So when you get an, a tyrosine that has one eye on it, attaching to a tyrosine that has two eyes on it, you make a T3 because that's one, two, three iodines. So the T3 are two tyrosine residues bound together to have three eyes. 
T4 is where you have two tyrosine residues that bind together that have two eyes on them each. So we call that a T2 and a T2, which makes up a T4. Over here, you have a T1 and a T2, that makes a T3. So uh, we get our T3 and our T4s on the protein. The protein is then endocytosed back into the cell. And the term when we endocytose on a small scale is called pinocytosis. The protein is sent to the cellular stomach, which is called the lysosome. It breaks the protein down and it releases the T3 and T4, which diffuses out into the blood. Now, T3 and T4 are fat soluble. They don't like the watery blood. So they have to bind to a transport protein. So look at this abbreviation. Every student co confuses it. I've been doing it a long time. All, everybody confuses this. TBG looks very similar to TGB. TBG stands for thyroxin binding globulin. Thyroxin binding globulin binds the T3 and T4s and transports them in the blood. TGB stands for thyroglobulin, which is the globular protein that has the tyrosines on it that is needed to make the T3 and T4s to begin with. All right, so don't confuse them. All right, so. We're going to stop here. I'm going to go over some of the functions of thyroid hormones next time. We're going to finish up the rest of the glands that we have to uh, complete. We have about, I don't know, 18 slides or so left to cover, and we have to start chapter 20. So from now on, what you guys need to try and do, if you have a printer, is print the PowerPoint out so you can write notes on the PowerPoint. And don't print one slide per page. It's going to eat up your ink. I, would, I usually print three PowerPoint slides per page. When you do that, it gives you little bitty note lines out to the side. You can write notes by each slide. Or you can just have a, a notepad out. So if you don't know how to change, how to print a PowerPoint, watch real quick and I'll show you. You hit the file button. You then go to print. But you don't hit print directly. You, where it says all slides, you need to leave, but then you need to change this, where it says full page slides. You don't want that. You want to hit the down button. You want to click on the one that has three slides per page, and you can see how it has little note lines out beside it. So this is the one I can read the best. It makes it smaller the more you put on a page. So depending on how well, you can put four on a page. I just think that's too small, all right? All right, so that's how you print that out. Um, so does anybody have any questions before I end the meeting for today? Um, I have a question uh, regarding like lab. I had bought this from City Park Campus and it's the um, City Park one. It doesn't matter which one. That's the one we use. Okay, and um, do you, where can I find your Thing. Can I find it on Amazon, your lab manual? No, no, they don't print it anymore, but you already have access to it. So okay. you, you have my entire book for free. Okay. But I, what I did is I separated it out into chapters in little modules for you. Okay. And, and this morning, right before lecture, I, because I actually, I forgot to do what I said I would do last night. I'm sorry. I, I, but this morning I posted the answer key to all of the figures that are in the chapters of my book. Okay. All right, so you can see that in there as well. Okay, and I have uh, one other question. Ahead. Okay. Um, will it be beneficial to print the uh, lecture notes for uh, here? Um, I always say print the lecture notes and the PowerPoint because I write all of my own questions for the unit test. And that, those are the two main documents where I write my questions from. So for the unit test, you don't have to go sit there and memorize all those Wiley Plus questions. I mean, the information is the same, but I don't, I don't use the Wiley plus test banks for our unit test. All right. Thank so you, you're, you're welcome. Thank Go you. Ahead. Um, the Wiley plus, how much do you need? Like I'd be trying to 
like I don't know, last like last semester I do so much. How, how much do you have to do just so you can finally get credit for it? Okay, you're you don't have to do the adaptive practice. All right. Let me stop sharing my screen and go back real quick if we're done with this this PowerPoint. Let me because I have to stop sharing and then share again. Hold on. Let me stop sharing that. Let me bounce out of here. Let me go back to share screen and to here. All right, so let's go to the, at the modules page. Because mm -hmm. I get this a lot, th these questions. The only, these adaptive practice assignments are not worth any points. It's only for practice. You literally could do them over and over and over again. Each one of them is a series of, I don't know, three or 400 questions. And you could just keep getting more and more and more and more questions fielded, uh, thrown at you and you field more questions. It's just for practice. Now you could sit there and do them if you want, which I, I like them because I think it helps. It makes you look up the answers and, by reading the book. And the more you look up answers to questions and read, the more you're learning. However, you aren't going to get any credit for these because I make them worth nothing for the course. They're just there for practice. The, the only homework assignments that are going to be worth points on your grade are the discussion questions, a chapter quiz, and a chapter test. So all of the discussions and quizzes count as 10%. All of the chapter tests count as 10%. So this is the 20% of your grade, these open book assignments right here. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions concerning that? Um, I had a question regarding lab. Okay. So um, when I was taking the pre, the pre-test or uh -huh. like you know, the the one before class, um, like where do you find most of those images? Would that be through the lab book? Okay. So it it, it depends. Now, could somebody else email me about that? Some of the images won't have the pointers on them. However, the reason why I set up those assignments so that you can see the correct answer is mm -hmm. to study from it because you'll see the pointers on the assignment. Let's say you get it wrong the first time. You have unlimited attempts on the pre ones anyway. Yeah. So let, let's say you do it the first time. You should be able to see the correct answer immediately. So go back through your test and look at what the answers are and then go take it again. Now, when you take it again, you might not get the exact same question right? because it comes from a pool. But ultimately, after you take it a couple of times, you're going to see the majority of, of what you're going to see on the practical. So some of those specifically for the uh, histology portion um, in later chapters, some there, there are histology talks, like some of those virtual learning resources. But if you ever, let's say you wanna know what something is on a picture, because I didn't put together every single learning resource. So the only way that I'm gonna know what you need, a, that you are confused on, is if you take a screenshot of it. And if you take a screenshot of it and send it to me, what I can do is run it through Photoshop, I can, put circles around it and put labels on it and then send it back to you or okay. post it for everybody else in the course. Because if you're having a problem with one, probably everybody else is as well. Just take a screenshot of it. That way I know exactly what slide it is and I'll just label everything on it myself and then post it in our Canvas site. Okay. If you can't get it from reviewing your assignment, I mean, right? Because yeah. all of those things are going to pop up with the right answer. You're going to be able to see what they are. Okay. Um, and you said you posted the answers. Where do I find that? I couldn't find it in the thing. Um, I posted the answer. Uh, maybe I didn't hit the publish button. It should be in the engage module. I posted it right below the engage link to access the engage website. Ah, uh, okay. It's I see. in that, it's in that I same see. module. I'm also going to post an announcement and post a link to it in an announcement as well. So everybody knows where it's at. Okay. Thank you and, so much. And you're welcome. And in that appendix, the figure numbers, you follow the figure numbers coincide with the figure numbers in my chapter. Okay. okay. All right. 
So does that cover everybody's question? Do you have any more questions? All right, well, thank you all for staying so long. I know you're tired. Um, normally, face-to-face, -face, we wouldn't have this much time, but I think we got a little bit more work done. It feels, feels pretty good to do that, right? You gonna know, I'm tired. Um, all right, so uh, if you have questions, just go ahead and email me. Um, if not, for some of y'all, I'll see you Monday at 11. And for the rest of y'all, I'll see you Tuesday at 925 so we can get out. I guess we should meet a little early for lab too, so we can get the uh, attendance done. All right. All right. You guys have a good weekend and be very productive, but also take some time for yourself. Not a whole lot of time, but some. All right. I'll talk to y'all later. Thank you. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you.